Um, so yeah, so we're coming up. It's uh, unfortunately January seems to have flown by, um, and it, it you know time time goes faster as you get older, I guess. Um, but February first is what it, uh, is basically National Surface Day worldwide, um, and many people are probably questioning why do we have a day that is there to think about things. Well, um, despite your personal viewpoint, um, snakes have been kind of this um, you know symbol uh, in, in many cultures and and uh, in many ways it's not always a negative symbol, right? But they do have some negative connotations in some cultures, but they have been a symbol of medicine, good, evil, fertility, um, and, you know, it has some form um, uh, of, of belonging in almost every culture because of, of the diversity of the locations that we have in snakes worldwide. Uh, in many ways, um, genetically, uh, a lot of our species, including ourselves, are kind of hardwired to have a reaction to anything that somewhat looks like a snake. Uh, you can even test this out by throwing a rope underneath somebody un unknowingly, and they'll tend to jump back. And that's kind of a, a hardwiring of us to try to get away from a potentially um, dangerous uh, uh, animal. Um, though uh, the message I have here today is that the majority of the snakes that we encounter, especially in Kentucky, are not that, and we don't have those stories. Um, but, um, you know, the way these animals are viewed, um, as I mentioned, can be good or evil, but a lot of times there was at least um, and knowing that, you know, the venom that some of these species had um, was, you know, outside of being dangerous to get to the, the what those animals needed in order to, say, catch their prey or subdue their prey, uh, it's been used in various ways uh, within cultures, including as painkillers and, and more, you know, more modern as we understand chemistry and how uh, the properties that these venoms have. Um, you know, we were applying to things like hypertension, treatment for strokes, heart disease, and even cancer have been explored. Uh, so there's a lot of value potentially in even the most dangerous part of having snakes around. Um, and just a little evolutionary note, uh, in 2015, we, we found the oldest fossil uh, for a snake, which is 100, really to be 113 million years old, and it was found as a four-legged snake. So it had all the, the correct things except additional legs. Um, and that was found in Brazil. Uh, and so uh, this is thought to be one of the earliest snakes um, within, you know, that order the, of, of species, um, but is one that, you know, they have been around for a long time. Um, and that's why there's, they've been able to build that history with many of our human cultures. On top of that, there's a fairly diverse group of species. Um, there's approximately 3,000 species of snakes worldwide, uh, with only one in eight being venom, and they are all shapes, sizes, colors, right, including, um, you know, things like worm snakes and, and, and so on, uh, as well as this uh, very pretty uh, red-sided garter uh, snake, which is um, similar and related to our garter snake that we have here in Kentucky, uh, just a little bit flashier. Uh, this is the California red-sided garter. Um, and with that diversity, this number of species, we have a lot of, of species snakes that will inhabit a, pretty much every type of habitat that we have uh, globally minus, you know, the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, that is one place we are lacking, but we have things like sea snakes uh, and, you know, snakes that specialize in grasslands that survive in deserts that, um, you know, are, are completely um, aquatic, semi-aquatic. They are all over the board, including arboreal, terrestrial, and fossorial, which means in the trees, on the ground, and under the ground. So we, we carry it in, Cover the entire gamut. Um, and with all these species, they are generally most diverse in tropical environments, right? And we're going to talk about why that makes sense here in a second. Um, but the, the three areas that are going to carry the most diversity are places like Mexico, Brazil, and India. Uh, they are the three that have well over uh, 300 species of snakes. And, you know, as you can see, the tropics is where that's located. Uh, we are in here in the United States are, are in the 200 to 299. And um, we have been still finding, as was the case with many wildlife species and insects, um, new species uh, uh, even recently, which included the world's smallest snake, the Barbados red snake, which is about four inches long as an adult, and it's pictured there. Uh, but the longest snake, which is always the question to get, right? What's the smallest snake? What's the largest snake? Um, well, the longest snake is the reticulated python, which have been seen upwards of 33 feet. Uh, and those that care about the venomous side, 
the largest venomous snake is the king cobra, which is upwards of 18 feet. Now, they may be the longest, they are not the heaviest. The heaviest snake uh, comes in uh, at almost 500 pounds, and that is the green anaconda, which makes sense that it is a uh, aquatic snake, right? So anacondas are aquatic snakes, because supporting 500 pounds of snake on, a, on the land would be rather difficult. However, um, just a picture of the, that's the, one of the pythons in the Everglades, um, and that snake that's pictured there, you can't even see the head, that's only a 17-foot long snake. So you can imagine almost doubling that and what that equates to and trying to move across uh, the ground and with you know potentially all that weight. Um, the thread snakes are a group of very small snakes, uh, as you can see, but the, the Barbados one, I believe, was just found in 2018. So that's our, one of our newer snake species that also was this small. Um, and why do we care? Uh, why do we have a natural serpent bay on top of the cultural ramifications? Um, well, these, these um, animals uh, have an important role in many of our ecosystems. Um, and, you know, getting back to why we see most of them in the tropics, that, that number of species and diversity. Well, tropics, um, the energy that's there, the temperature, the consistency um, allows for a lot of diversification uh, of, of species. Um, but also, when you're a cold-blooded group of organisms that really rely on external energy to keep your metabolism going, you're going to have a lot easier time surviving where it is constantly warm. Uh, so, um, though we have snakes that do live um, in, in temperate forests and, and boreal forests uh, somewhat, um, they are very few and far between. Uh, so, you have a lot less of them and therefore a lot less ability to diversify into many species. Um, but for the most part, all, you know, snakes are predators, they're carnivores. Uh, and as Dr. Price would say, the easiest thing to fit inside a snake is another snake. Uh, so there's cannibalism that goes on, and quite a few species in Kentucky do that. Um, but many, um, many of these guys are, are rather abundant within the systems that they live in. Uh, and because they're all carnivores, they act as a major uh, control mechanism for a lot of the species that are actually pest species for us, things like rodents. Um, and that with that in mind, so that prey control has a lot of benefits in society. On top of, it's been shown that um, rattlesnakes um, in areas with Lyme disease act as a, a mechanism to help limit the the source of Lyme, right? So Lyme disease has a cycle where the ticks attach to rodents, and then uh, a secondary cycle where the ro uh, tick attaches to that rodent, and then goes and gets that blood meal and goes to, to a human. So if you limit the number of rodents within the system, you actually lower the transmission of Lyme disease. So the only way that happens is major control mechanism within those woods are snakes, and in particular, rattlesnakes. So rattlesnakes have been linked to a lower level of Lyme disease where they're present. So they have some benefits and wildlife health uh, component inside, right? Human health, as well as pet Um they are uh, have the ability to get to extreme populations, uh, and especially like I mentioned, uh, that picture of the python in, in the Everlake. Uh, we have a major problem in some areas with invasive species. Uh, Florida has got to the point where they're so good at uh, predation that they're actually um, causing drastic declines of many of our native mammal species, uh, the marsh rabbit, um, and and even you know um, there's pictures of the pythons killing alligators. Uh, so uh, they are really good at what they do, and um, they can get to larger numbers of populations to have a major impact on many other species, whether they are invasive or not. Uh, so that's kind of the, the benefit, and not such a good benefit if they don't belong there, uh, side of snakes and serpents. Now, this is the nightmare component that everyone, uh, I get phone calls about, and this is an actual picture I submitted from someone to the idea snake. Um, and Taking National Serpent Day down to what you need to know in Kentucky. Uh, so if you have this snake sitting there, you're probably wondering, is this something that can hurt me? Well, um, first and foremost, no, it is not. That is just a, a rat snake that is unfortunately climbing in places it shouldn't be and popping out and scaring you, uh, or at least startling. Uh, but general things that we want to talk about about living with snakes in Kentucky, because they are that important role in the ecosystem, is first and foremost, you want to identify the snake you're dealing with. And if you can't identify it, leave it alone move away from them. Um, of the 34 species of snake we have in Kentucky, four are potentially venomous uh, and could cause you a problem. Um, realistically, it's three. Um, so the odds are 
you are not looking at a, a venomous snake. Um, but if you want to limit those chances, especially around the places you live, um, reduce those shrubby areas around your house, your garden, keep your grass mowed short. Uh, anything that could attract a rodent, you want to get rid of, or anything that could protect the snake from aerial predators, because many of their, their, their predators are actually things like hawks or owls. Um, so anything that would protect them from that, you want to make sure that that's limited in areas that you do not want to see a snake around. And though um, we just heard about not messing with rock piles, you don't want any rock piles around where you don't want snakes, because that is a definite attractor uh, as a cover source and food source, uh, along with things like piles of metal or wood piles. All those are good for snakes, not so good if you don't want to see it. Um, so have a snake around, identify it, can identify it, leave it alone. Uh, or use extreme caution with moving it. Um, and in order to help you identify, we have this wonderful resource that was put together by some of my colleagues here uh, in the department, uh, including one of the hosts of the show, uh, which is our Kentucky Snake Identification Site. Uh, and that walks you through all the snakes that we have in Kentucky and ways that you can uh, identify what you're looking at. Uh, and um, you know, key features that you're gonna need to pay attention to if you have a snake in front of you, body shape, okay? Um, other things, uh, head shape, most people say triangle head is a venomous snake, which is true with pit vipers, but we have several snakes that will actually flatten their head out to make it look like a venomous snake. Uh, so you want to use multiple, um, characteristics to help make that ID. Uh, and one of those is one of the more common species that you'll run into, uh, which is your water snake, um, or group of species that you run into. Water snakes will commonly flatten their head out to, to project as a, a threat. Uh, to anything they view as a threat. Um, one of the best ones though that we have that we can use in Kentucky that doesn't necessarily hold true in other areas, but does hold true in Kentucky, which is that our uh, non-venomous species, their pupils, which if you're close enough to look at a pupil, you're probably too close, uh, are round, uh, whereas our pit vipers, our four venomous species, all have that cat eye slit pupil, uh, so it's vertical. Uh, they also have, and this is where you're too close, uh, these pits, which help them hunt and, and find prey and understand what's going on around them. Now, one of the things I commonly get is uh, I found a, a shed, a snake skin shed in my, my garage or in my attic. Is this, a, is this a venomous snake or is this a copperhead? And one of the things that we can use in Kentucky is this um, use of, of the uh, post the vet, the vent scale uh, configuration. Uh, so this is behind where they, uh, the way to where they poop, the vet. Um, so it's the tail. You look at, there's a big uh, scale, and then there will be either a continuation of, of single scale, so there'll be big vents, a double scale set, and then after that, you have either um, single row of scale uh, from that vent to the end of the tail, or a double row. Um, the non venomous species are going to have double rows all the way to the end of their tail, whereas the venomous species will only have that single set of double row, and then it'll be single row of scales all the way to the end. So if you find a, a snake skin and the tail is in good shape, you can actually look at that end of the tail and determine if it is a venomous species or a non-venomous species. That is the best that we can do. Um, which for most people is enough uh, to help them uh, get some comfort. Um, finally, tail characteristics of living ones that are uh, still attached to their skin uh, is, um, you know, with venomous species, we have two that you should pay attention to, rattlesnake, that end tail, rattle on that tail is a kind of a giveaway. Uh, whereas our copperheads, especially our juvenile copperheads, uh, well, only our juvenile copperheads will have an actual yellow tip on their tail that they use to attract prey when they're young. Uh, but it is a dead giveaway that, you know, there's no other snake that we have with a yellow tail at the end. Uh, so that is a no touch, uh, getaway from indication. Um, wrap this up. I know we're, kind of running close in time here. Um, remember that we have lots of benefits from these animals. They're a vital component of our ecosystems. I mentioned kind of that public health side of things, the tick disease, the tick control, uh, but these guys are, are really out there um, in, in numerous uh, you know, components uh, of the, the, the uh, food chain in terms of top-down regulation of many of the animals that we do not want more of uh, that can cause a lot of problems for the ecosystem. So if you remove them, you're, you're potentially causing a, a major impact in the system. Um, so we want to try to keep them around whenever possible. Make sure you ID that snake if you see one so, so that you're safe. 
Uh, remember that we have this wonderful resource of the, the snake identification site to use. And if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to contact me. I get lots of snake emails on a regular basis, uh, probably about eight to 10 a day come starting in April when these guys come out of hibernation. Uh, so I'm used to that and I will walk you through how to, to identify the picture. Uh, as you see here with this one, where we have this um, Hershey Kiss banding pattern where that dark band is uh, comes up and narrows at the top and is wide at the bottom. That's what we call what I would call Hershey Kiss. Being from Pennsylvania, that's a, a very important thing to me. Um, that's a giveaway for uh, a copperhead in the state of Kentucky, where as many snakes are banded, none of them are going to have that Hershey Kiss look to them. Uh, so that is a, a pretty good giveaway. And there's hints like that all over that website.